Welcome to Make the Grade with the success doctor, Stephen Green, where you'll discover actionable strategies to help your student to reach their academic goals, to excel at standardized testing, and to plan for the college admissions process painlessly. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Green. This is the Make the Great Podcast, your host, poster with the moster, Dr. Stephen Green. You know why we're here? I want to give you actions, strategies, game plans, call what you may, to accelerate you on your path to success, whether you're a student, a parent of a student, or an entrepreneur. Because sometimes I am solo on this podcast, but today I got an excellent guest. I want to welcome from New York City, Mark Hirschberg. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. Thank you for coming on. Let me tell you a little bit about Mark. I'm going to jump right in. He's an author. Let me tell you, it's not easy writing a book. Trust me. I've been there. Uh, he's an author of a book called The Career Toolbox, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Okay. He was educated at MIT. Oh, he's smart. <laughs> um, he has spent his career launching and fixing new ventures at startups, Fortune 500s, and academia. He's developed new software languages, online marketplaces, new authentication systems, and track criminals and terrorists on the dark web. Man, you, you're like a you're like a Renaissance guy. I don't know what I was getting myself into here, man. This guy's got it all. Mark helped create the undergraduate practice opportunities program at MIT. Career Success Accelerator. Wow. So he's got it going where he's taught for 20 years. He also serves on the boards of nonprofit called Techie Youth and Plant a Million Corals. So Mark, welcome. If nothing else, you sound like a, a person who's got a lot of interests and a lot of talent. Um, but let's start with this one. You, you decided to write a book, right? I did. Your book is called... Tell us what it's called. I know what it's called, but I want you to say it. Give you some passion here. What's your the career called? toolkit, essential skills for success that no one taught you. No. Okay. So here's the thing. I want you to answer this question. I want you to tell us why you wrote the book and any backstory you want. Why are these things not being taught? Great question. We, we, I mean, we're going right in the deep end here, brother. So go ahead. What do you, what do you think? High school is a modern invention. It goes back about 150 years and it was designed as we left the farms and went into the industrialized workforce. We need folks to have those three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic. This is the Schwab focus. Rockefeller system. Go ahead. In 1910, yeah. you didn't need to know how to network to work on an assembly line. Leadership mm -hmm. wasn't so important. So we never really put this into high school. Colleges are run by professors. I like them very much. I work with them, but they are narrow experts. They're experts in chemistry or accounting, or whatever their field is. And when you show up, they say, well, we, the experts have decided if you want a degree in our field, you need to acquire this knowledge. And so when you get an accounting degree, all they're saying, they're not saying you're a good accountant. They're just saying you have acquired this level of knowledge in accounting. We don't know if you're good at, we certainly don't know if you're good as an overall employee. We just say you've acquired this knowledge. That's all a bachelor's degree does. And that was fine in 1950 when you sat there in your desk and your manager came to you and said, do this work. And you say, yes, sir. And you were the cog in the machine. The but that doesn't man. The company work. man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately, academia is a little behind the times in terms of teaching the skill sets that we need today. That's why at MIT, we created the Career Success Accelerator. We looked at the skills that companies said they want. And we said, it's time that we start to deliver these skills to our students. Can you be specific? So networking, there are personal skills. I mean, give, give me some examples. My book covers 10 skills. And again, this comes from surveys of companies. This is not just for MIT students or technical people or this, even students. This, this, Universal is, this is the world population. The 10 skills, there are three sections in my book, section one careers, how to create and execute a career plan, how to work effectively, mm -hmm. things like managing your manager, understand corporate culture, how to interview both as a candidate, but also many of us have to hire our peers or subordinates. So both sides of interviewing. Mm -hmm. yes. Second section, leadership and management, three chapters, one on leadership, one on the people side of management, 
and one on the process side of management. Wow. And then the third section, interpersonal dynamics, has chapters on communication, networking, negotiating, and ethics. So is this book uh, like 700,000 pages? It's only 270 <laughs> pages. Only 200 people. That, that's like, that's like, that's like a light read on a Saturday afternoon. Now well, I'm, I'm half thing. joking with you, Mark, because these here's, are, you could probably written a book about it. You could probably written 10 books here. Exactly. And I knew people don't have time for that. In fact, the way my book is written, you can open the book and say, I'm going right to chapter eight. I'm going to skip mm -hmm. the first seven. Then you go to chapter two, then you can pick up any individual chapter like a toolkit. You can grab the tool you need. So you don't have to read it straight through, go to what you need when you need it. And each chapter so takes 30 to 40 minutes to read. So it's a very small effort when you say, I want to get better at this skill. And this was born out of need as uh, verbalized, maybe not literally by you or somebody else talking to people in the corporate world, in the business world, and they're saying, hey, this guy, Johnny's a great, great accountant in terms of um, technique, but he can't get along with any of his coworkers, or he doesn't know how to work on a team, or whatever, fill in the blank. Um, All of the above, yeah. And now, and, and is this an idea that just came to you individually, or was this something that was a team effort, or... Is this something that I'm sure it evolved over some amount of time, right? But what was the initial genesis of this idea? It was a catalyst of two things happening. In my own career, I knew I was a software engineer at the time. I knew I wanted to become a CTO, a chief technology officer, the person in charge of the engineers. And as I asked myself, what do I need to be able to get this job? Mm -hmm. I realized there are all these skills beyond being a good engineer. I needed to know leadership, negotiating, team building, communicating, but no one ever taught me. So I began to develop the skills in myself and quickly realized these skills are not just for executives. They are for everyone, down to the most junior people, down to the summer interns. We all benefit when all of us have these skills. So I began to upskill my team. And as I was doing so, MIT had done some surveys of companies found these very same skills and wanted to put together a program. When I heard about that, I said, you know, I've developed some material. I'm happy to share it. I thought that'd be a one-off meeting, but they asked me to help develop some of the curriculum and then asked me to teach, which I've been doing now for decades. And so I've not only taught at MIT, I speak about, I do other things. I develop people in the nonprofits and the companies I'm at. And so I realized I want to reach a larger audience. And that's what the book lets me do. There's no question, in my mind at least, that there's a huge need for these skills. And, and, and let's, let's explore this a little bit. It's not just in the live workplace setting. It's also online. Okay, because look, how, how do a lot of people network now, especially in the last two years, which in case you're listening to this in 2048, has been COVID uh, ridden. So people are going to the LinkedIn's of the world and uh, maybe primarily LinkedIn as a business thing, but there's plenty of social media platforms. And there's an almost unwritten etiquette in a lot of these things as well, right? So I would, I'm going to go out on a limb maybe slightly, and I don't know if you wrote it, your book, to address needs in that area too, but I see people posting online and it's like, I need a job. <laughs> I mean, there, there's no there's no conversation. There's no give and take, there's no um, finding out about somebody else's interest or making it a collaborative, mutually beneficial circumstance, which, which to me, I don't know if they're in your book specifically, but probably are tangentially because these are universal ideas. But who, who, this may not be the easiest question to answer, but I'd like to hear what you think. At what stage should somebody get this book? Should they buy it when they're just getting to college? Should they buy it as they're starting to develop their career or maybe read it? you know, buy it, then read it. Uh, where do you think this would help people the most? Is there an optimal entry point here? The answer is when you're ready for it. Ooh, and, okay, good. now what does that mean? How, yeah, how do you figure out the answer? Yeah, that's, a, hey, that's, a, that's a non answer. <laughs> now, it's for, a good answer, but uh, so it's when somebody's ready. Okay, so, so for, a for a lot of people that might be as you're graduating college, early 20s, we saw this is a very popular graduation gift. 
Because as you're thinking, mm -hmm. I'm going into my first job, I'm focusing on this. So 20 is, of course, a natural time. Mm -hmm. I've met people in their 40s, 50s, even the 60s, who when they've gotten the book have said, wow, this is great. I can use this because there's a lot of concrete, specific things you can do today. But I say, boy, I wish I had this 20 years ago. In fact, that's probably the most common statement in the Amazon reviews. I wish I had this 20 years ago. Can it work for a high school student? The answer is maybe. And I, I say this, you know, obviously, I'd like to see books get sold. For me as a high school student, I probably wasn't the right mindset to pay attention to this and care about it. But mm -hmm. I know there are students who are more mature than I was who would have been ready. So when you say, I think I want to get better at leading, at networking, at communicating. Whenever you say that, that's when you want to pick up this book. How do people get the book? Website, selling it direct? How, how, how does somebody obtain your book? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. Okay. And there, if you follow the buy link, it can take you to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or you can even get through local bookstores. So you can follow that link and get all the usual places. And there's a whole bunch of other great resources online. There is a free app on the Android and iPhone stores that's okay. linked yeah. from the website. So that's we'll going to help you that a little bit more. Keep mm -hmm. There's also on the resources page, I have a bunch of free downloads, things that can help you, questions to ask as a candidate during an interview, questions to help you figure out what you might want to do with your own career if you're not sure what direction you want to go in. There are development guides for how to learn this along with a group of other people, which is really the best way to learn these skills mm -hmm. and links to other free resources online. So all of this at the career toolkit book.com. Tell me about the app. Does the app kind of bring the book to life? Is it interactive or is it kind of a digital version of the book? We're all what I have found whenever you read a book like mine, a business book, even a self-help book, or even listen to a podcast like this, you say, okay, wow, so much good advice. And then you forget a week or two later yeah, because we get right. busy, we move on. So I want people to retain this. My job isn't to get you to buy pieces of paper. My job is to help you improve and do better. So with the app, you download, has a lot of the great tips from the book, the specific things you can do and what it's going to do. You just need to open it once a month so we know that you're active and it's going to pop up a notification each day at a time you set with a reminder of one of the things you can do. Hmm. That's gonna help keep it top of mind. That's gonna help keep you, help you retain it. It's spaced repetition, fancy name for look at the book a second right, time. Right. You no, know, you're yeah. not gonna open the book. <laughs> yeah, really, come on. Hey, or let me, you, let me or the ahead, other thing you can do, you can open the app, say you're about to go into an interview. Oh, what were all the things Mark said in the book? Open it up, flip through those tips and get that refresher. I'm gonna read a quote. Quote, this is not a book that you read once and put aside. Page after page, there are useful tips. You can open any random page at any time and learn a new skill that you can put into practice immediately. End of quote. Love it. Forbes magazine. Yes. Gordon Wonderful Gordon quote from Forbes. Yeah, that's a, that is some pretty serious uh, praise from a very highly regarded business uh, source. What, what? I mean, I don't want to make this completely about the book because you're a super interesting person too, Mark, but what are you most proud of about this book? Do you consider this like your magnum opus? Is, are there more books in you? Do you is there like a, um, a, a version two or is there like a next level or are you going to drill down any of the aspects within it? I'm curious if you have aspirations that way. There are about seven other books I have <laughs> etched Only out. Seven. Okay. And so I can go in different directions. I think I figured out which one to do next. Uh, the one mm -hmm. thing I've learned from friends is when you write a book, you don't just write it, say, okay, it's out there, now do the next book. You need to be out there going on podcasts, talking yes, about it, marketing it. So I've got at least another year of focusing on this one before I start to write the next one. You know, I heard, I'm reading your bio here. I mean, you're like, you're like all over the place. You, he, I'm here, Mark is one of the top ranked ballroom dancers in the country. Like former. Florida Stair, like former, well, still. You, you, you wanna see me dance? <laughs> no, you don't, trust me. Is it like Fred Astaire kind of dancing? Like, 
that kind of thing? That, that what you'd learn at Fred Astaire or Arthur Murray, I used to go all over the country to compete. That was a really? wonderful period of my life. Dang. And it's, it's like, in, like with a partner, like, so you're dancing with another person. Wow. Yeah. You have your set partner, you train together, and then you go to the competitions and get judged against the other dancers. It's like what you see on Dancing with the Stars, except we're all on the floor at the same time. And the judges in 90 seconds have this to pick. This is like, uh, I can't think of a name of the dance, like merengue, you know, like, no, like, what do you call it? Um, Cha-cha, samba, cha-cha. waltz, tango, foxtrot, swing. Mm. See, I, I am always, I always admire anybody who can do something. I have no skill out at all. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I mean, I, my wife's like, you just stepped on my foot. Yeah, and she's like, yeah, yeah. wow. How'd you get into that? I mean, is it just somebody like your parents were into it and they got you into it? Or one day you just saw it on TV and like, I want to do that? Oh, no, my, my mother forced me to take some lessons as a kid. I hated it. I got into it when I was at MIT because the MIT club is one of the biggest ballroom clubs probably in the country. I and so I joined that. the okay. club. I started social dancing. I then started dating a girl and got her. She was a dancer, but not ballroom. So she started dancing with me. Huh. And then after, I think, about a year, she decided that she wanted to join the team and compete which apparently meant I had also decided I wanted to join the team. You got her into it, man. It was your responsibility at that point. So, and then you, so you you were able to travel the whole country. Yeah, I went to the national championships, I think for six years. Really? They have like trophies and stuff, I'm sure. Gold medals. They have have trophies, yeah. Yeah. I've got a bunch of them boxed up. Every year you got a big Halloween party. Okay, you'll have to invite me to that. Um, A cufflink collection. Who wears cufflinks in 2022? Very few people, even before (laughs) you and your neighbor. I mean, I do. I am wearing. And listen, if you're not, it's it's, this is not. If you're hearing this, he is wearing a cufflink. He just showed it to me on the screen. How many you got? How many pairs you got? First of all, in case people don't know, cufflink comes in pairs, one for each arm, right? Okay. How many pairs you got, Mark? Uh, Just over 400. Dang. So you go you go over a year without uh, repeating. I can. And now the thing about my cufflinks, most people, I think cufflinks, you've got a square, a rectangle. That's boring. I don't like this. I've got maybe a few of them. My cufflinks, they're food. I've got pizza. I've got bagels, lock and cream cheese. I've got hot dogs. I have planes, trains, automobiles. Not the actual food, but like like a metal casting of it. Yeah, like a a version of it. I've got pumpkins and Christmas trees, menorahs and matzah. I've got things for different things you might do. So whatever I'm doing a particular day or if the oh, day so is you're, a dog okay. day, I've got a cufflink for it. Somewhere in my somewhere in my desk here, I actually have a pair of cufflinks, which I, if I if I had known this about you, I would have pulled them out. We could have been like cufflink uh, brothers. Hey, this is the Make the Ray podcast. You are with me, Steve Green, and my guest, Mark Hirschberg, author of the Career Tool Block. Is it true? I don't want to say it wrong. The Career Toolkit book, right? Yes. Listen, if nothing else, this book, this book might save your career. This book might elevate you because a lot of times, once you get in, especially in the corporate gig, it's all about how you get along with people. Everybody's good. Everybody knows what they're doing in their job. It's the people that can work the system and the people that can get in. I'm not saying like be brown nosers. I'm saying just be good. It's all about being a people person. Um, and, you know, Mark's got so much going on. Let me, let me dig into the book a little bit more. Biggest takeaway from the book, okay? What do you hope people get out of this book, okay? As an author, it's like your baby. I've written a couple of books. It's the same thing. I want people to love my book, but more importantly, it makes me happier when they come to say, like, I read your book and I was able to use this in a meeting. I was able to use this in school. That's what kind of gives me that warm and fuzzy feeling. What, what does that for you? What pains me in life is people who don't live up to their potential. They get Mm. stuck in jobs they don't like or want to hit a certain level and just don't know how to get there. So my dream is that people can use this book, the app, my talks, however they get the content and use it to help their professional efficacy and achieve Mm. their dreams. How much is your book? It retails for $28.95 and usually it's even cheaper on Amazon. So for 30 bucks, this is this isn't even an, an investment. I mean, you can't even leverage this. This could be worth millions of dollars. I'm not even exaggerating. 
Because you, you get in with the right thing and you close a deal, you get their promotion. I mean, this is enormous. Give me an example. You got a little yeah, case study example, or something? Al. Please There's do. a chapter on negotiating. So let's imagine the following. Imagine you're 25 years old and you have a job offer for $60,000. Okay. But instead of taking the job as is, you've read the chapter on negotiating. So you go and negotiate and you negotiate for 61000 just $1,000 more. That's pretty small. You can imagine doing that. Yeah. If you do nothing else, five minutes of negotiation, you accept the job. If you stay in that job for 40 years, you just earned yourself $1,000 more for 40 years. You read my chapter, five minutes of negotiating. That's with no raise. That's with no raise at all. Right. And that's insane because, of course, you'll have raises, you'll have promotions, you'll have other jobs. If you learn to negotiate, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. And now I use negotiation as an example because we can do the math, but the secret is the same is true if you get better at leadership or networking or communicating. No one says you're a better leader, here's a thousand dollars more, but you stand out, you get promoted faster, you get the jobs, it's going to lead to that success. So the key thing here is investing some time. We're not talking about being the world's best negotiator, we're not talking about being the world's best leader, but if you get a little bit better, you can achieve so much more success, financial and otherwise. And that completely justifies the cost of the book and the time you'd put in reading it. Now, the cost of the book is, is, is nominal. I'll, I'll yeah. even go to this far more. I'm going to buy some books from you. I'm going to give them away to anybody who listens to this podcast, who reaches out to me and just sends me any sort of compelling reason why they need this book. Okay. Is that a fair offer? Wonderful. I think that's a pretty yeah, fair fantastic. offer. Thank you. Here's, here's, here's what it is. Let's be clear. I'm, I'm not going to do it for 500 books. I don't got that kind of scratch. But I'm going to say five books, okay? Any five people listening to this, you email, you know how to get a hold of me. It's all over the podcast site. Email me, social media, whatever you want to do. And you just tell me, it doesn't have to be your life story. You've heard what's in here. You've heard the nine or 10 things Mark espouses. Which one do you think would help you the most and how are you going to use it? And I will send you his book for free on me as my gift for listening and being a, a, a participant here. Um, Mark, let's, let's, let's circle back to something uh, that we really started with here. And then we're going to kind of close this out a little bit. And, by, and I got to tell you, you're welcome back anytime. Fantastic info. Do you think the climate is catching up to the times? Clearly what you brought to MIT, um, I don't want to say it's game changing. But, but maybe it is. But are you seeing a ripple effect? Now, maybe other schools are bringing these things in. I mean, there are schools that have centers for entrepreneurism. There are schools that are a little bit off the um, beaten path, in a sense, in terms of how the curriculum is. I don't think college as a, an, an uh, amalgam or an aggregate has changed all that much. But I think you are starting to see some, for lack of better terms, modern curriculum in there. But are you seeing any sort of shift that makes you feel like, wow, I may have done something that's really shifted a mega trend, you know, in a number of places? I hope that's true one day. I think it's still early. You're right that we've seen, there's been a push the last 20, 30 years for entrepreneurship centers. Okay. And while these skills certainly apply and help entrepreneurs, most of those centers focus more on the tactical how do you write a business plan? How do you come up with your financial model? It's like a micro MBA kind of. Yeah. With this, we're starting to see, I've seen at University of Michigan, I've seen at a few universities up in Canada, they're starting to say, you know what, our students, whatever their major, we have to start teaching them some of these other skills, mm -hmm. but they're more one-off classes. They're the types of things of, we'll give them one semester's worth of random lectures on these topics as opposed to an intentional set of skills and intentional way of teaching them. And you know what the challenge is there? And you brought this up before. Let me reiterate this. It's great information, but you know what? They may not be ready for it yet. It's too soon or maybe even too late because part of the brilliance here is the ability to have random access to this when you really need it. Because you're not going to need to negotiate every day of your life. Actually, if you're in sales, you might. But to negotiate, how often do you negotiate a salary, right? I mean, twice a year, I don't know. But some of these other things are daily habitual things. If you ran over that list of 10 again, I was thinking when you're saying it, I mean, I'm, I'm doing those things pretty much every day on a level. 
And I certainly, I've been in business longer than dirt and I haven't mastered them. <laughs> not that old, but I'm pretty old. Um, awesome. Well, listen, if anybody can shift this, I know you got the energy to do it. It just makes sense to me. I know my, one of my, my kids went to Temple and I'm uh, in Philly and they, they have classes on social networking, LinkedIn. They build that into their business school, but it's really more, uh, my, my observation was it was done more to make connections in, in almost like a job search thing. Um, so they can say, hey, you know, we are, you know, coming out of Fox Business School, you know, we have 99% of people graduate and get jobs. So they're, they're kind of pushing them through that pipeline a little bit and hopefully teaching them some networking skills as well. Is there anything you want to talk about that's in your book or maybe in your life that we haven't gotten to yet before we kind of bring this home? I'll mention one important thing to think about when learning these skills. These are different than how we traditionally learn. If you want to learn chemistry, you can open a book or take an online class and you're memorizing the periodic table. You're memorizing chemical equations, the electron so shell, yes, yes. knowledge transfer. Okay. These are not things you can just memorize. There is no formula for leadership. There's no three things to remember to communicate. Mm -hmm. It's much more subtle. It's closer to learning a sport. I can't just tell you, here are the rules of the sport, go do it. You have to practice, you have to try, you have to scrimmage and drill. Mm -hmm. And you probably so got to scrape your knees a little bit. To, the know. best way to learn these skills, the way we teach them at the MIT class and the way top business schools teach them is through peer learning. So create a group of people, create a cohort. Now you can do this if you're at a company, get your company to do it. And I have a free download on the resources page explaining how. Mm -hmm. If your company is not going to do it, Find others, create a local meetup group and do it. If you're mm -hmm. a parent and you want your kids to do this, get a couple other parents, get their friends. Here's the thing, you want to access some content. So yes, you can use my book and you might read 10 pages of the book. If you don't want to use my book, use a different article, use an online video, use a great podcast like this one. And yeah, after you hear yeah. the episode or read the pages, discuss it have that discussion because it's in that discussion that you get into the richness as we're talking about, let's say leadership, you're gonna say, well, this is what stood out for me or reminds me of this thing that I had. And we say, wow, I never would have thought of that. It's and almost gonna... like a book club meets a sort of like a cooking class in a sense, because you're producing something. I, I, I'll tell you, listen, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I would love to partner with you on stuff like this because I deal with this population every day. And I absolutely relate 100% that they need what you're delivering here. If you want to put that, we'll talk about that offline, but I'm, I'm psyched here. Hey, Mark Hirschberg from the Big Apple in New York. Oh, I dropped my pen. Uh, from the Big Apple in New York, thank you very much. You want to come down to Philly someday, I'll get you a, a cheesesteak or something, whatever you like to eat. Get some of your books. Let's get them out there on the street. Mark, you want to play everybody's favorite Make the Great Podcast game called Fave Five? Let's do it. And tell you about it. this is spontaneous. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just list a category. You tell me your favorite thing in this category. Okay. Don't right. overthink this. This is supposed to be fun. If you just relax. We did some heavy duty stuff here. Important. And again, give us the name of your book again, because I really want this to be front of the mind for people. The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success that No Beautiful. One Taught. Beautiful. Get it on Amazon everywhere you want, or you can get it from me if you listened before. Okay. Let's start with an easy one. Favorite color? Red. Nice. Red. The color of love. Favorite dessert? Chocolate chip cookies. Dang. Now I'm looking at Mark here. He's probably 140 pounds soaking wet. Oh, like no. I, I wish. I wish <laughs> I was close to that. Yeah, and he, he looks like he could afford to eat a few cookies. Me, on the other hand, I guess I got to cut back. Um, favorite place to vacation? You ever go on a vacation? You're a busy guy. You ever take a break? Yeah, I can tell you my top three cities are Bangkok, Copenhagen, and Dublin. Dang. Say that again. Bangkok, Copenhagen. Bangkok, Copenhagen, and Dublin. So Thailand, Denmark, and Ireland. What, give us a read. What do, you, what do you like about them? Food? Vibe? What do, you, what do you like? Copenhagen strikes me as the most quintessential European city. Super clean. That's the one thing that struck me there. You could eat off the sidewalk there. I mean, I don't Dublin, know if you literally would, but it is unbelievable. Dublin, yeah, what do you like about Dublin? Dublin is just, 
it's nice. It's fun. It's accessible as someone whose Spanish is super rusty and Hebrew never took. I can, mm -hmm. I can speak the language in Dublin. It's a nice, charming city. Hmm. And then Copen, uh, then um, Bangkok. Bangkok. Not only were the friendliest people I have ever met in Bangkok. I don't mean like one person. I mean consistently, the people were incredible. Thai but people. I love the dichotomy of this ancient city with thousand-year-old temples. And then this mm -hmm. modern city emerging from it. It was just this Somebody wonderful. Somebody told me there's like no crime in Bangkok because if a Thai person commits a crime against a foreigner, they go to jail for like life. It's like this ridiculous, the um, punishment doesn't necessarily fit the crime, but they do it because they, they promote tourism so much. Who told me that? Somebody on a podcast, I forget now. That's wow. interesting. People kept coming up to me. I kept thinking, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm thinking they're going to scam me. Someone's going to try picking my pocket. Yeah. I was on guard. They were all just so friendly and nice. I, I and got that same vibe in Tokyo. I think it's like an Asian, like Asian uh, company or country. They just the way they live life. They, they're just people, people. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, you may not get that on the subway in Manhattan. <laughs> uh, music. You still listen to ballroom dance music or you got another taste? Uh, I do listen to ballroom. I also love 80s music and the one hit wonders. I like mm. top 40, big band, some classical. What would be a typical song you'd, li you'd listen to while you were dancing? Like in the mood, like that kind of thing? In the mood could work for Foxtrot, Sinatra. Let me see, hang on. Let me see if I can pull that. I, I guarantee you there's people listening who don't know what that song is. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. Hold that thought. You know yeah, what song you're talking about, right? That, that's Goodman, classic right? big band. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Other big band like Pennsylvania 65,000. Um, sing, sing, sing. That's a good quick Oogie step. Oogie Bugle Boy? Uh, that's a jive, yep. Let's see if but you can think about song. Sinatra is my favorite. Uh, Bobby Darren and Sinatra, their songs are usually good foxtrots. Here, here's the part everybody knows. Mm -hmm. i put that on the side there. It's a little loud, but I've been to like 800 weddings where they play that song. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, what's on your bucket list, man? You you have been around. You've been around. So anything anything you, you got to do? And uh, you're a young guy in the next however many years. Yeah, wife and kids, top ah. of the bucket list. Okay. Well, you got you're a good negotiator. <laughs> you're gonna need I, that. Trust me. I've been where you are, where you want. You got to be a good negotiator. You got all, listen. All those things in your book that you were about business. A lot of them you don't think about. They apply to relationships because this is all really about relationships on a level. You got a head start, man. It's good. Hey, this is this is a loaded question. Loaded question. What's your favorite podcast? <laughs> I, know, I know it's it's, it's backing you into a corner here a little bit. You, you are my 299th podcast recording. Are you serious? 299? So I'm going to say, like a parent, it's so hard to choose a favorite child. Oh, all right. I, the, the diplomacy trumps the fact that you didn't make an answer. It's, that's good. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can think of a bonus one then. Did dessert. What do I usually ask people? I forget. I'm blanking now. Favorite TV uh, show. Favorite TV show? Well, yes, you said in your thing, so I know the answer to that. But what, what, do you, what is it? This is going to surprise most people. MASH. MASH. Because I am young for that really, demographic. When you say MASH, you probably uh, on reruns when you were, in a, you were in a baby. My parents what told me. What, what you always, what? My parents would always say they got to see the second half of MASH because it came on right at my bedtime as a kid and they'd have to go mm. sing me a lullaby to put me asleep. So they only got to see the second you know, I, half. I think until MASH was out in like the 80s, early, maybe 70s really late early. 70s, early 80s. MASH was considered the number one television show ever until mm. it got overtaken by Seinfeld and a couple other shows later, Friends probably too. Yeah, how about that? Other the finale of MASH was still the all time most watched television program even more than Seinfeld and Friends, even though there were more people and more people had TVs later, MASH still beat them. Huh. Look at this. Can you believe the information you get here? 
I think I knew that, but I somehow didn't know that. But yeah, but you're right. So that, so it was a high, way higher percentage of people who could watch it. Yeah. If you do the math. Hey, Mark, thank you very much. This was great. I, I, I'm going to tell you, seriously, people, consider getting this book. If you don't need it today, and you probably do, you're going to need it at some point. And if you don't, you got a child or a friend or, or a cohort or coworker and, and, and get the app. I mean, use what he's got here. This stuff is fantastic. Steve Green, the Make the Great Podcast. Mark Hertzberg, Mark Hertzberg. I'm tired today, sorry. Um, one last time, author of the Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success. No one taught you until now. You're going to add that to the end of the title for me. Um, hey, I got a lot of really good guests coming up. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I wanted to be number 300. Can, can you just lie and say I'm the 300th podcast? <laughs> now, whoever, listen, whoever gets you to be number 300 is lucky because you've got a lot of information. Fantastic guests. Thank you. Hey, we're going to be back here with plenty of people like Mark. I got some solo podcasts coming out uh, as well that are going to be informational. Mine are a little shorter, but uh, it's all about value here. So we will see you next time. If you want to be on the podcast, reach out. And here's all I ask people. If you liked what you heard today, please share this. What makes me happy is very simple. When as many people as possible get this information because it can help them, it can further their career, can further their academics, it can just level up everything that they're doing. That's how anybody could thank me if they want to go that direction. So Steve Green, the Make Three Podcast, we will see you next time. Let's get the theme music on here. And thanks again, Mark. You've been listening to Make the Grade with the success doctor, Stephen Green. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe. For more resources and support, please visit makethegrade.net.